Okay, so this is something that I still haven't fully processed. As of today, right now, Karine Jean-Pierre is the new White House press secretary. That means that a black lesbian is now the face and voice of the United States government. It's completely wild to think about, especially considering the fact that when Kareen was working as a staff member in the Obama White House, she couldn't even legally marry her partner. So on the podcast today, I want to celebrate this bit of good news, something that we in the community are desperately in need of. And to celebrate, I wanted to share this conversation that I had with Kareen when her memoir came out. That memoir is called Moving Forward, and the message of the book is that all of us, no matter what you might think of as a typical background or story for a politician, all of us have a place in politics. If Kareen Jean-Pierre, a queer woman of color who immigrated to the U.S. as a kid, could make it in politics, she says, then so can you. Who knows, you might even just be the next White House press secretary. When we spoke, Kareen was appearing on NBC and MSNBC as a political analyst, so you'll hear us talk about that, as well as what she learned working for a rather wide array of politicians, including John Edwards, Anthony Weiner, and of course, President Barack Obama. So from The Advocate magazine, in partnership with GLAAD, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and a Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm excited. Thank you. Yay. Let's jump in. All right. You write that your story is not the typical political story. Mm-hmm. You're an immigrant. You're a woman. You're mm-hmm. a woman of color. Mm-hmm. You're gay. Mm-hmm. And that is not what we typically see in politics. Yeah. And yet, I think it's easy to assume that that's changing with high-profile examples like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez yeah. and Elon Omar. And yet, those are very much outliers, right? Yeah. That's not the norm. It isn't the norm. And and like you were saying, like I walk in so many different communities, if you will, like I present so many different communities. And that was one of the parts of writing this book, I wanted to, I think people get really afraid when they hear politics and getting into politics or getting involved. And so that's one part of it. And I think the other part of it is that people always ask me, even young people, they ask me all the time. I teach at uh, Columbia University, so I have young people taking my class yearly, and they say, how did you get here? Like, how did you get into the White House? Like, how did you work in politics and get on different presidentials? And so the purpose of the book is also to share show, there's not one path. And also, as a person of color, gay person, a woman, an immigrant, I also wanted to show people who are all those things or one of those things like, hey, you know, she did it, I can do it too. So I lay that out in a in very detailed way. You know, as an immigrant, I grew up being told, oh, you're going to be one of those three professions, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. And that's, a, I think, in anybody who's listening and is, grew up in an immigrant family could totally understand that. And that didn't work out. I talk about that in the book. And then I talk about, I didn't get into politics until my mid twenties. And so, but you're right, there's representation matters and there's not a lot of representation. Even now there are like AOC, as you just mentioned, and others are kind of outliers. It's still a very small percentage of women of color, of people from different identities that are more diverse that's in the political arena. So The hope is that I can encourage, inspire people to not be afraid of the word politics uh, and to just get involved because the way you make change is if you get involved yourself. And, you know, watching you on TV, even though you don't mention being gay every time, Mm -hmm. it is a part it's not a secret. And you're like, no, um, and you're no, pers- I've been out for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like something that is easy to see about you. And I bring that up because I I think there's like tension between you bringing up being gay does not need to come up in every conversation. That's right. Yeah. And yet, I think it's so powerful to know that there is a gay person on TV. Yeah. So like, I also want you to bring up yeah. in every it's, conversation. It's really, it, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think about that sometimes because I'm like, I'm out. It's not hard to know that I'm that I'm out. I talk about my daughter, I talk about my partner in interviews, and it's out there. But I don't lead with that 
You know, it's like it's part of my multiple identities. I have multiple identities. And so it's it's a very interesting kind of way to be in the space. And it's actually kind of funny when people are like, I didn't know you were gay. And I'm like, how do you not know I'm gay? I've been out for a long time. They're like, wow. And so it's just it's funny. But I, I am aware of it. I am conscious of it. I want to respect all of, like I said, all of the communities that I represent. And were you to bring it up every episode, I would say like, oh my God, she brings it up every episode. Every time. It's like, what's wrong? <laughs> but if you don't every... bring it up ever, yeah. like once in a yeah. like she didn't bring it up. Yeah, it's like, you, yeah, it, yeah. And I, it's a way, I don't know how people, like majority of people feel about it, but I, tr- I just want, I want to lead with my experience and kind of my smarts, right? There's a reason I'm at this table and everything else just compliments me. You know, and that's a great point. Yeah. You know, we've mentioned the White House a couple of times. Can you just explain for everybody what your role was? Yeah. So that was one of the most amazing opportunities. I will never forget working in the White House for the first black president, you know, and <laughs> I, I miss those days. <laughs> yeah. You know, working in the White House, you felt the responsibility. You felt the weight of the country on your shoulders, the weight of the world. And you wanted to be good at your job and not screw it up because you knew, at least for me, I knew that I was representing, everything that I was doing, I was representing President Barack Obama. If I went out and talked to people in different states or picked up the phone, I was representing Barack Obama. That experience was really wonderful. I worked in the White House Office of Political Affairs. I was the Northeast political director. And basically what that meant is I managed the politics in about, I think, 11 or 12 states uh, in the Northeast. I had to have my finger on the pulse of what was going on and what people were saying, you know, how people were feeling about about the presidency. And if he did put specific political events, I've traveled with him and the vice president, sometimes the first lady. And also anytime we had to talk to a governor or a mayor or a political figure in the state, I was the one managing that relationship. And if he were to go into like New York or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania, which was one of the states, I was in the room, I was with him, I was doing briefings and I was briefing him, writing memos. It was just an amazing job. Amazing, amazing. I'm, I was there the first two years, which was, I would argue, the most hectic years. It was just an amazing experience. So similar to my question about talking about being gay on TV, how open or not were you working in the White House? Oh, wow. I was pretty open by then. So we're talking about 2009. Yeah, I was pretty open. I was not. I was out. I even did um, It Gets Better, the White House It Gets Better video. I was uh, one of the people who produced it. And I was I was also uh, told my story on tape, on video. So I was out. I mean, I had a partner at the time. She had been to the White House a couple of times with me for events. By then, I was, it was not a, it, I was out. Yeah. So Barack Obama, during his first campaign and the first term of his presidency, he very definitively stated that he was not in favor of gay marriage. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I was like to work for him during that. So it was so it was hard because back then in 2007, um, in that president, in the 2008 presidential election, pretty much everybody I think was, uh, there was one candidate that was for gay marriage, um, but everybody had the same kind of mentality around it. And it was sad because I, and it did bother me. I walked around really feeling a little bit like I wasn't appreciated or accepted. I worked for John Edwards first in 2007, then in 2008, um, he dropped out. Then I went to go work for Obama. I think for many of us who were out, who were gay, it was part of politics that was difficult. Are you saying that at that time, yeah. his anti-gay marriage stance was not unusual? So it, it wasn't unusual. It was common. Yeah. You know, I think it was Kucinich, maybe, that was the only one who was running at that time who was for it. Do you think that Barack Obama being in favor of gay marriage while he was still president is one of the things that, like, turned the tide so quickly? I think so. Absolutely. Um, I never thought about that. I, I, ah, yeah, I think so. I think when... Obama came out and in, I think it was 2011, 2012. 2012. Okay, it was 2012, right before the election. 
it set a tide. It set a wave. I think when you have the president of the United States, a commander in chief, a black man um, making such a powerful, strong statement, it does send a mass message. And, um, and he's, you know, popular. People respect him. Um, you're talking about bring him bringing along also the religious community, the black religious community. And so that that was an important move uh, when he did that. Because now it's kind of amazing that in four short years, yeah. no Democratic candidate could have been anti-gay marriage. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you can't. Like now, it's like it's it's it would be out of step. You know, very very out of step. And to be fair to Vice President Biden, he was the one that first. I don't know if you remember in 2012, he came out first and supported marriage equality, and then Obama did. That's pretty unique for them to yeah. have yeah. split like that. Yeah, it was, yeah. And you know, Biden is an older Irish Catholic man. And he was there. So in 2012, when Barack Obama announced that his position changed or yeah. evolved, let's yeah. say, yeah. he cited conversations with friends, family, coworkers, yeah. staff. Did yeah. you staff, feel like yeah. a personal victory? I would assume so. Because when I left, you know, like I said, I was out. Um, it was no secret. And when I left the White House to go work in the administration, you do this uh, Oval Office kind of goodbye with the president. You take a picture with, you know, with the president and your your family. And I brought my girlfriend at the time. And uh, he knew I was going to go to sh- move to Chicago to work on the reelection. So it was, you know, he was very respective of it. You know, re- very, per- you know, very respectful, very supportive of of our relationships. Everyone who was there that, that um, had a same-sex re- partner. And uh, I think he was always ready. I don't think he was, I don't think he wasn't. I think it's the being out publicly was the step that he took. But he was always in support of us. You're saying it was a political calculation. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, it's politics, right? That's kind of the name of the game. But, you know, I think he was hoping to move, help move the country with where he was. You know, it's like you kind of have to get the country there or, you know, people feeling where, you know, get them to educate them and get them to that point. And then he came out publicly. That's fascinating. Now, with the girlfriend you mentioned, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to move past that because yeah. you wrote that you got to work at the White House yeah. around 7 a.m. You didn't leave before 9 p.m. Yeah. And that if your boss would email you at 2 a.m., yeah. you expect a response yeah. ASAP. Yeah. That just sounds horrible to me. It's tough. It I'm is tough. Surprised you were able to maintain a relationship. Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> that's why she's an ex girlfriend. That's why she's an ex girlfriend. <laughs> uh, for many reasons, but that's one of them uh, in particular. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. You work 12-hour days or more, six, seven days a week, and there is a task at hand. It is helping to run the country, helping to push, you know, the platform of the president and do the people's business. I mean, that is what it calls for, you know? Now you're a mom? Yeah. Could you even have considered having a kid? No. Our daughter is five years old. She's amazing, wonderful kid. And if you had told me six years ago, seven years ago, hey, Kareen, you're going to live in the suburbs. You're going to have a child. You're going to have this wonderful, amazing partner. You're going to have a dog. And you're going to live in a cul-de-sac. And it's going to be wonderful and amazing. I would have said, are you kidding me? Because I spent the last you know, 10 years of my life working on campaigns, one campaign from another campaign, not staying at a job all that long because of the campaign component and what that means, sleeping on different couches, living in one city for three months, one city for six months. And so... So it is. It was just not something that I never saw myself being in one place, raising a child, and what that all meant, and having a loving partner. And I have that. And so, uh, yeah, it, I'm sh- I'm shocked. I'm shocked that I have the life that I have right now, and I'm happy, a hundred and ten percent. That is so funny. Yeah. Your early experience in politics were with John Edwards mm-hmm. and Anthony Weiner. Mm-hmm. Both mm-hmm. of those people had really high profile scandals. Yeah. Since that was your, you know, initial entry into politics. Yeah. Did part of you ever wonder if that is just how all politicians are? So it's interesting because I, I have a I have a chapter called Flawed Candidates and I bring it up because any any young person or anyone who's in politics, they may have to deal with something like that. And one of the things that we do is we elevate people. We put them on a pedestal and people are flawed. No one is perfect. And so that's 
something that I talk about. And I, I also want young people to be able to take care of this, themselves if you have a flawed candidate. And what does that mean? So when I worked for Anthony Weiner, it was before Carlos Danger and all of <laughs> all of the insanity and the really quite awfulness of what happened there. He was, when I worked for him, it was three months in 2008. It was between the Edwards dropping out and Obama and working on Obama. And he was the darling. He was actually the darling of the Democratic Party. People thought he was going to run for mayor, maybe senator one day, governor. Like they had high hopes for him because he was a great communicator. That's always something that I say about him. He was he was a hard worker and an excellent communicator. You wrote he's one of the most gifted politicians I've ever seen. I, he is one of the most gifted politicians I've ever, ever seen. Just watching him. I was his press secretary at the time. And I happened to leave because somebody from uh, that I worked on the Edwards campaign, who was now with the Obama campaign, getting ready at the time to get the general election ready, reached out to me and she said, hey, do you want to move to Chicago and go and work in the general election for Obama? And I said, yes. And I left. So I wasn't there for very long, but I wanted to bring that up and talk about flawed candidates. Now, Edwards, kind of the same. The new, I was working for Edwards. And there was the National Enquirer had broke um, the story that he had an affair, but it was denied. Nobody really believed it. It was kind of weird because, and also it's the National Enquirer. So it was, it was kind of murky. And then months later, it was proven to be, to be true. And so much more came, so much more came after that. I mean, in context, I wasn't there when they were quote unquote flawed, but I know that it's something that sits on my resume, right? I worked for Anthony Weiner and I worked for John Edwards. So I wanted to put that in the in the book because we do this thing of elevating people and people are flawed and we should care more about their platform and their issues and what they're pushing out more than the person. And it's hard because politics is, is that game. You know, it, it's really the person that we look at. Yeah, and I, I think a lot about what makes a good politician versus what makes somebody want to be a politician. Yeah. And like, I think you wrote about in your book, but like, I have to wonder if like a massive ego is just a requirement. I think it is. I think narcissism, ego plays a big role. I mean, just think about it. You think that you are the best person to run the free world, for example, right? You think you are the only one that could change, you know, change the country or move it into a certain direction, that takes a lot of ego. It takes a lot of narcissism. Um, so I think that is that is part of the ingredient. And I think, too, like something that I uh, mm -hmm. see is that like what our concept of ego is, is gendered a bit because mm. I see women having an issue. And like what I can identify is it appears to be like a lack of ego when also we don't allow women to have an ego, but we demand it in order yeah. to like run for president. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think life would be so much better if women had, <laughs> women would be able to like run the country all together. <laughs> but I think there's a couple things that play into that. I think, yes, I think there is some biases when it comes to gender biases, when it comes to, we say, oh, we're ready for a woman president, and then we're really not. But I remember in 2016, there were focus groups uh, during that election, and women were asked, some women were asked, oh, you know, what do you think about, pre you know, potential President Hillary Clinton, about her candidacy? And they say, a woman should not be, you know, it's not a woman, woman can't be president, it's a man. So there is, there is this kind of old school thinking that I think truly exists out there. I thought that the flawed politician chapter was so interesting because here are really talented politicians, John mm -hmm. Edwards, Anthony Weiner, um, Bill Clinton mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. They're amazing politicians who also have this need to at best behave inappropriately mm -hmm. and at worst behave illegally. <laughs> Oh, you gosh. know, and it's like if they could just like get rid of that like personal life and heat, yeah, we yeah. would hold them up in so such a high regard. Yeah, it's it's disappointing. I mean, this is the point. It's like people are human and they're flawed, you know, and we have to understand that people are not perfect, and that's the problem with elected officials, with people in political space. We tend to lift them up in that regard, you know, and we forget. They're flawed. You know, not everyone is perfect. They're human. You know, they're not superheroes. You know, as a naturalized citizen, do you think yeah. you have a different view on politics? Huh. 
Well, I'll say this. Both my parents were born in Haiti. I was born in Martinique. They grew up in a dictatorship. And so I think in this current moment, when you have a president that seems to love dictators more than our allies and praises dictators and ignores our allies, growing up in a Haitian household, you're very aware of what it means to live in a dictatorship. And so one of the things that I worry about is our democracy. We are a young democracy. We're 240, 250 years old, and I don't think people realize that. You know, hearing those stories and knowing the, the history of the, by the country of my parents' birth, so there is a level of fear that I understand, um, that I worry about, because I have that history. So that's my biggest, biggest concern And I think that also motivates me to really try to inspire and motivate others to get involved in politics. Does it motivate you to want to run for office? I get asked that question all the time. Oh, my goodness. I'm shocked. Oh, yeah. So I've thought about it in the past. That's like my most honest answer. Right now, for me, I want to get him out in 2020. Like the focus is getting people energized, getting people out there, making sure like we take back our country in 2020. And then after that, I can figure out what's next for me. Like I said, I teach, uh, I teach at a university, um, grad students and undergrad students, and they ask me for advice all the time. And the advice that I give them is follow your passion, follow what you believe in, what moves you, and everything else will come. Because I, I truly believe that's true. Okay, let me push back for a second yeah, because yeah. you in the book describe yourself as a late bloomer. Yeah. I think like early on you did not know what your passion was. Right? So exactly what do you tell right. a student who's in that position? And I, I tell them it's okay. I tell them it, it's good to be a late bloomer. It's good to get that experience. Don't stress yourself out. Don't, uh, you know, feel like you have to be like everybody else. You are your own person, you know, and that's, that's part of the book too. It's like you will find your own path. And once you find it, you'll take off, which is what happened to me. Once I found my pa- my passion and was excited about it, clearly, because it's your passion about it, I took off. And in a f- few short years, I ended up in the White House. I mean, that is, that's what I mean. You know, you go with where your heart is. And even, you know, when you, a- when you ask me about running for, for, for office, right now I'm doing my passion. My passion is working for a progressive organization that's part of this resistance that we call it in the past three years and being on TV and having a voice and having a platform. And I love it. I love it because I think I'm making a difference and being a voice for people who feel like they don't have a voice. And that's my passion. Everything you just described also gives you time to have a family. Yeah. Right? It's hard. but Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, on a book tour. I'm gone and gone for days and days and days. And it's hard because I'm not seeing my little one. But yeah, you know, I I think the reason that I'm sane and I'm not stressed out or I'm not like, you know, having a crazy, crazy time of it in the past three years is I have a family. You know, I have, I can take a break and I force myself to take a break and focus on, you know, my partner and my daughter and our dog and do family things. And it is, it is good to be loved and know that there's a place of love to go to. And it's good to be supportive and it's good to have that escape. And I ask that because I think that there's like a sense in, in the, United States today, Mm. that you can be career ambitious, but to be like family and personal life ambitious is less like socially acceptable to talk about. Yeah, no, I, I, I push people to do it. It matters. It matters to, I think it's great to be, you know, career, career wise, focused and ambitious. There's nothing wrong with that. And I was, I was like that, like I said earlier for, you know, until six years ago. And it's changed my life. It's made me a lot happier. And maybe some people, they don't want that, which is great. I mean, you know, I don't want to push family on people, you know, and that's not for everyone. And I totally understand that. And sometimes someone's career makes them really happy when they're in at 100% or just achieving whatever the goals they have for themselves. So I don't want to push family on people just to push family on people. Oh, I don't think you are at all. I want to ask more a question. We're almost out of time. But you write that you still feel hopeful about the future of America. And I think that like contradicts a little bit of what you said about the dictator and how you're scared. So do you just mind explaining that a bit? Yeah. So I'll go back to 2017 Inauguration Day. 
and um, I was part of um, uh, part of a broadcast, and I was giving my political commentary. The next day, the Women's March happened, and hundreds of thousands of women um, descended on Washington, D.C. I got to see it. I got to talk about it on TV, and it was inspiring. And the next weekend, we had the Muslim ban, which was awful, but then people showed up organically at airports and protested and offered their services. And, you know, then you fast forward to the repeal of ACA. You had people who showed up and put their bodies on the line, like the disability communities and many other communities, and said, no, we're not going to repeal ACA. There has just been moment after moment. Families belong together. There was a family that belongs together. This is connected to 2018 when we learned about the zero tolerance policy, where the Trump administration was separating babies from their parents at the border, and people came together together. And they said, this is not the country that we want to be. And so I, th- I have seen these wonderful moments that give me hope. While I'm scared, as you said, about what, this, what Donald Trump means to our democracy long term, there is hope. And I think that's kind of where, you know, I fall there. I think I see, I see it and I know it exists and I think we can be hopeful. We just have to work. And that was Corinne Jean-Pierre, the newest White House press secretary. If you enjoy this interview, please take a moment and share it with just one person in your life. That can be through text message or on social media. Doing this is truly the biggest way you can help our show grow and stay free, to be completely honest. So if you can do that for us, then I promise in return, I will put out an interview on this podcast with one of the biggest musicians in the world, okay? Specifically in two weeks as we kick off Pride Month. So I hope I've piqued your interest. But seriously, thank you so much to everyone who's doing that right now. It truly is a massive, massive help. We are brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with LAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters on Twitter and Instagram at JeffMasters1. Come find me and I'll see you there 